Hi, everybody. Um, Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Well, it's super exciting to be here. Um, it's been a long time since I've been in high school, and I haven't spoken to high school students in a long time, so I'm excited to to hear your all's questions. Um, I think oftentimes the way that like non-academics or people who are not yet in graduate school or college, who, the people who think about history kind of in the most interesting way sometimes are not the experts. And the questions that, that kind of uh, young people have or non-experts have are oftentimes like kind of interesting for us to, to kind of, we're, we're stuck in our books and our ways of thinking professionally about history. So it's always cool to, to talk to different audiences. Um, so yeah, so I'm a, a professor, a, cl a clinical associate professor. I can talk about what that title means. There's a bunch of different titles in academia uh, of history. And I, I teach at Arizona State University in Tempe, uh, which is where your teacher, Mr. Gribos, uh, is, uh was a master's student. Um, and so um, that's that's how our connection, we, we uh, had a class with him. And uh, I love teaching the, the master's program at ASU. It's fully online and most not maybe about half or a little bit less than half of our students are high school teachers. And so it's always cool to like work with the, first of all, they're amazing students themselves, right? Your teachers are, um, but then they go out and, and bring what they learn, the critical ways of thinking about history into the classroom in, in ways that I think impact the world more important than what I do is what the high school teacher does, right? Cause you all are going to go out and live all these different kinds of lives. You're not all going to be historians necessarily, but you're going to bring with you your kind of critical knowledge of the past, your ways of interpreting how the past matters for the present and the future. And all that starts in the history classroom in middle school, high school. Um, so I always appreciate the work that teachers like yours do. Um, without it, history doesn't matter. If, it's, if you all aren't learning history and using it in your lives in whatever way, in your conversations and the way you work, whatever job you get, then history doesn't matter. It just stays in books, right? Um, so, so yeah, so I um, actually didn't start out as a, a kind of lover of history at your age. I was an, an into athletics and and kind of later on even into like parties and stuff like that. Um, but then what, what really drew me into academia to wanting to kind of become an academic was the study of religion. Um, so it'll be a kind of secure, it was a circuitous path that brought me to the discipline of history. But I, I grew up in, a, in the Catholic faith in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, and then I left the church, and I was always fascinated by kind of how religious institutions like the Catholic Church uh, affected the lives of people like me or migrant, you know, immigrant communities from Italy, you know, France, um, Spain, and Ireland, right? How those communities brought their Catholicism with them to the United States and impacted this once Protestant nation, et cetera, right? All of those questions were really interesting me, to me growing up. And what really drew me into the region of Latin America, which is what I study and which we're going to talk about today mostly, uh, was be the dominance of the Catholic Church throughout the history of what this region that we call Latin America. Um, and so that's one of the kind of core components of what makes the region of Latin America, what it is, is the shared kind of colonial history dating back to Spain and Portugal, right? And the, the development of national communities after independence, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. But the, the Catholic, I'm in Peru right now. So I, I actually um, got permission to work fully remote for this period. And I'm living with my wife and son in Lima, Peru. Um, and the Catholic Church is still all around here. Uh, all the federal holidays are Catholic holidays here. Students get Holy Week off. Um, it's really kind of interesting to come from the U.S. where religious tolerance and pluralism is so embedded in the kind of constitution and the way of being in society to a place like Peru or Mexico or Brazil, where the Catholic Church is still very dominant, not just numerically, but institutionally, right? Schools, public schools teach theology here. Um, so there's so many differences um, that are always to, to my eye, right? I'm a, kind of obsessed with the question of religion. Are really fascinating to me. Um, so I majored in religious studies in college. I didn't know, you might not know that's a major. I think there were six of us at my school. Um, and then I went on to do a PhD in history. Um, so still, I still research and write about religion, religion and politics uh, in, the, in the modern period. So mostly 19th and 20th century, uh, specifically in Peru. I'm really fascinated in these questions of church and state, um, secularization, these kinds of things. Um, so yeah, so then I got my first job out of graduate school was at ASU, and here I am. I started six years ago, so I've been teaching at the graduate level and, and some undergraduate classes as well for for about six years, and uh, it's been awesome. I've been lucky, uh, but if I could go back to being your age, sitting in, I wouldn't be in history club, <laughs> uh, and I and I wasn't, I didn't know that's what I wanted to do. Um, so I kind of found my way to the discipline of history in a kind of in a roundabout way. 
Um, but I'm, I'm certainly glad I, I have. And it's awesome to see folks interested at your age in these things. And that doesn't mean you have to all become academics or practicing or even amateur historians. Being whatever it is you want to be, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever it is, and having historical knowledge and thinking critically about using primary sources and interpreting the past is going to serve you. And it's going to serve the people you work with and work for. Everyone's better off if we have a sense of where we came from, how we got here, why things went wrong and what went right, what we might go back and do differently if we could. All of that stuff matters so much, I think, um, for for life together on Earth, right? Like It's essential. It's just as essential as science uh, or any other discipline, I would argue. So it's really it, it kind of inspiring to see to see you all here and be able to to speak with you all about history, something I love and and I think you all too. Question for you all uh, uh, to start and then ask any questions, like I said, if they come up. What, how would you describe this landmass? What is this called? America. America, singular. Okay. Any other? The Americas. The Americas. Good. I think a lot of, so the way I was trained in, in school, right, to think about this is as, as like separate continents, right? So North and South America. Um, which is actually not the norm. So if you go to schools in, in Colombia or Venezuela or Paraguay, they learn that this is one continent called America, which is the first answer one of you all said. Um, so you're all, you're all already thinking more like uh, Latin Americans see this region, right? This land mass. Um, it's it, geographically, right? There's a, you know, there's a canal built there in Panama, but really it's all one land mass. Um, the Isthmus of Panama connects all the way through, right? Um, and so in, in Latin American schools, they learn that there's this is one continent. Um, but naming is really important when we think about the region that we live in, right? This hemisphere is another way to think about it. Some people will call this the Western Hemisphere, even though technically like most of Ireland and the UK and Western Africa is actually part, in, uh, part of the Western Hemisphere. It gets kind of split up, but you can use that terminology as well. Whereas, like I said, in, in Spanish and Portuguese, you're going to hear people say America. This is just, this is America. It's all America. And so when, if you've ever been abroad, uh, visiting Argentina or wherever, and you're like, oh, soy americano, if you say that, they're going to say, yo también, me too, right? We're all, we're all American. You're, you're, estadounidense, you're United Statesian is the, the Spanish and Portuguese way of saying it. So it's just interesting to think about the way we relate to the rest of our and some people would say backyard, um, as, as many uh, statesmen in U.S. history would think about Latin America. And we'll talk in a second about that. Uh, but the terminology, I think, is interesting and, and useful when we ask questions about what is Latin America and how does North America or Anglo America or the United States relate to this region, right, that's so close, so intimately tied historically through immigration, through interpolitical uh, dynamics, through economics, et cetera, right? And then this is the region that most of you would probably think of if I said Latin America, right? Uh, what is, what is, where does the word Latin come from in this terminology? Why do we call it Latin America? Someone said Spanish. Okay, so Spanish being a Latin, like, like a Romance language, right? They don't speak Latin in Latin America, right? Uh, what other languages do people speak in Latin America? Portuguese, someone said. Latin based languages. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, that's where the term comes. It's, it's a 19th century invention, the term Latin America by a European scholar. Um, but it's referring to the kind of romance languages, right? So in, in the opposition, the opposite of Latin America at that time was Anglo America, which was the English speaking part, Canada and the United States and the British Caribbean. Um, and so that you can see the kind of amorphous uh, categories that we have all these different ways of calling ourselves different Americans, but none of them are actually that clean, right? They are all have kind of these fuzzy boundaries. Um, so if Spanish and Portuguese uh, are part of, La or, you know, the language, the, the countries that whose official language is Spanish and Portuguese, right, are part of Latin America, what do we do about Haiti, right? So a lot of scholars of Latin America consider Haiti historically to be part of Latin America. Um, and so if that's the case, then what do we do about, here, I'll go to one more image. What do we do about French Canada, right? Or French Louisiana, right? Like, I mean, Canada still has, if you've ever been to Montreal, I drove up, I think when I was 19 years old from my house in Massachusetts to go uh, celebrate New Year's. So I've been once and it, everything was in French. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize, you know, I didn't know, I wasn't a history, uh, interested in history at the time. Uh, but why don't we consider French Canada to be part of Latin America if Haiti is? Uh, 
right? These are interesting kind of questions to problematize this concept in general of Latin America. Uh, so these are the British speaking countries and islands of the Americas. Where do they fit in, right? Some of them are still part of the Commonwealth. Some of them have become independent like Guyana, uh, Belize, but they all have Jamaica, have past uh, relations to Britain, just like the 13 colonies um, uh, on the Eastern seaboard of North America. Uh, so again, another kind of complicating factor. Uh, there are uh, in South America, which is a term that a lot of people use to say when they want to say Latin America, they'll be like, yeah, South America. Well, South America is this subcontinent, right? But not all of this subcontinent fits well into the Latin America category. So French Guyana is part of France. It's part of literally part of France. It's part of mainland France or overseas France, but it's it's uh, part of the, the French nation. Uh, Guyana is an independent nation that was once uh, British. And then Suriname was once Dutch. The Dutch are another um, important colonial power that, that left its traces linguistically, culturally. Obviously, uh, New Netherlands in what is now New York was really important for a long time. But still today, people speak Dutch in the island of Curaçao and in other parts of the Caribbean. Um, so these legacies, these colonial legacies are something that the Americas all share, right? Um, they all share these different kind of overlapping uh, but complicated and blurry lines of imperialism from British, uh, sorry, from European empires, right? And they overlap in all these really interesting ways. Um, so we talked about, so here, here's an, uh, a linguistic example. So if we think of Spanish being the most dominant language in the Americas as a whole and in Latin America, right, with Brazil being the main exception uh, with Portuguese, Look at all of the Spanish speakers in the Western United States and in the cities and in Chicago and Florida, right? The United States has more Spanish speakers than Bolivia. The United States has more Spanish speakers than Spain, right? So are we part of Latin America? Is the United States part of Latin America, right? It certainly was uh, before the, the Mexican-American War, right? It's must, much of the West was part of Mexico and Spain before that, New Spain. Um, so all of these different questions kind of show us how not separate we are, right? I mean, if you lived uh, where, where I used to live in, in Arizona, we were two hours from the border, but it was, you felt like you were in a Spanish speaking uh, country a lot of times and in certain neighborhoods where you're, you're not necessarily so distant, right? You're not so far away uh, culturally, linguistically, or even geographically in many cases. Another way of thinking about the Americas and America as a whole, as kind of sharing histories is to go back before the colonial period. So these are language groups in the Americas, right? North and South America here um, of the native peoples who have been here for tens of thousands of years speaking native languages, right? That in, in, there's all these fascinating bubbles. So on the left-hand side, you can see that big green spot that's over like what's now the Southwest and the Mountain West, Colorado. And then down again, that same color you can see in, in Western, Northwestern Mexico, Sonora, that actually goes down into Mexico where the Aztecs, so the Aztecs have a shared language group with the native peoples of the American Southwest, right? So Nahuatl and languages uh, that are spoken in the Southwest of the United States, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, share the same family because of migration patterns. Um, so there's all of these kind of shared layers, right? Um, in South America, there's all these different language groups that are still super important here in Peru, Quechua, is the most important language group uh, with uh, millions of language of Quechua language speakers. Um, so it's not just all of these colonial overlays, right? It's this underlying indigenous uh, societal, linguistic, cultural uh, bedrock that makes this part of the world, this half of the world or uh, third of the world's geography so unique and, and kind of more tied together than we think. Any questions? I told you I wasn't gonna lecture and now I'm lecturing, <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, the language groups are so fascinating. If you, you all, you're in Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. So the, all of the, I mean, Pennsylvania is just like New England in that the town names are so many of them are indigenous language names, right? So I used to live in Narragansett, Rhode Island, right? Named after the Narragansett tribe, which is still there. They're not in Narragansett anymore because it's desirable real estate. So they got pushed off to long, long ago to land that was less desirable. Um, but there's obviously still all these linguistic and cultural ties still, even in places like the Northeast where the where there's smaller native populations than in places like California or Arizona. And then the other, the other kind of way to think about the Americas and our shared 
past is the impact of enslaved people being brought to all of the region, right? You can see the, the different purple spots. Uh, Brazil received more slaves than the American South did. Um, the, the Caribbean, right? Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, right? All of those populations were you know, dramatically devastated by colonization, the native populations, and then repopulated with enslaved Africans. Um, and then places like Peru, places like Colombia, Venezuela, um, that you might not expect have big uh, black populations now and, and mixed race populations from the, the, the legacy of, of enslavement. Uh, now, when, when independence comes, almost every Latin American Republic frees its slaves as part of the call for independence. Um, some of the, sometimes it's to have fighters in places like Venezuela. They were like, we need you guys to fight with us. Um, but uh, but it was part of independence in a way that it was not uh, in what becomes the United States. Uh, and obviously, Haiti is its own unique case of uh, an enslaved population claiming and, and winning independence um, just a, you know, a half a generation after the United States does. Uh, but all of these legacies are so fascinating to me because you you might feel like if you've ever been to Brazil or if you've ever been to Uruguay or wherever, you might feel like, oh, this is such a different place. But in so many ways, the patterns that have made these nations uh, what they are is so similar because they're not the old nations of Europe that had kings and hereditary dynasties and thousands of years of linguistic and economic and cultural development in one place that was kind of like the French and the British hate each other for a million years, right? For I'm exaggerating, but for thousands of years. And it's like this, this American experiment is so unique uh, in human history. Um, and it brings people from all of the rest of the world. There's another wave after and people are enslaved, people are freed in, in Latin America. There's a huge immigration from China and Japan uh, of what were uh, derogatorily called coolie workers, right? So indentured servants. And there's a huge population of Japanese and Chinese. The, the president in the 90s here was Fujimori, a Japanese descended man. The food in, in Lima, for example, is a mix of like fusion of Japanese and uh, Andean food and Spanish food. So like there's all of these kind of waves that you you um, can kind of trace the kind you can you can take the the cultural makeup and the social makeup and political makeup of these countries and kind of follow it back to uh, obviously before the colonial period. Uh, now, my interest in religion always has me looking at like the role of the Catholic Church in Latin America as outsized as being really key to what makes Latin America what it is is this one of the things is this shared Catholic history, right? So being Catholic already is really unique when you're a citizen of a nation, because there's always these questions about who's in charge, the Pope or the president, right? Or the king, if, if you go back to European history, and there's always these kind of debates about where the rules should come from, where the political philosophies should come from. And in so many ways, the nations of Latin America drew on what are, is oftentimes called a kind of corporatism, an idea of uh, society working together as a body, right? So some people are the feet, some people are the legs, some people are the heads, some people are the hands, and they should all kind of stay where they belong so that the, the body as a whole can work the body politic. That general philosophy kind of animates legal and political thought in Latin America throughout the 19th century after independence, uh, whereas in the United States, kind of liberal uh, enlightenment ideas hold a more uh, central place, right? And you guys have all studied that, I'm sure. Uh, that's not to say that Bolivar and San Martin and the liberators of Latin America weren't influenced by kind of progressive liberal uh, ideas of politics. But if you look at the history of Colombia, Cuba, Mexico, El Salvador, you're going to find a lot more uh, instances of authoritarianism in uh, and what used to be called caudillos, right, a strong man leader uh, in the history of these countries, whereas in the United States, it's a little bit harder to find that, right, the, the protection of the kind of terms of the voting as a kind of sacred right, all of that is a very U.S. American and then, uh, you know, uh, European model of liberalism, whereas in Latin America, there's kind of a little bit more of a regal, a royal, almost kind of like dating back to Spanish and, and uh, Portuguese colonial thinking kind of way of organizing politics and society. I'm going to stop talking. I, th I, th I thought I was going to be able to ask good questions with these with these slides. But if any questions you have or I can go back to another slide.
if you have questions about any of these. Um, I'll ask one. You talked about strongmen and dictators. Can you talk a little bit about um, the U.S. role in that, whether we're influencing and impacting, whether uh, sending Marines or funding different groups against or to support some of these uh, countries? And I'm trying to talk specifically about like the Cold War. Yeah. Yeah. The, the history of U.S in uh, kind of international relations with Latin America has periods and the Cold War is 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 kind of its own period and it's kind of not. Um, so the the good neighbor policy of FDR in the 1930s, this idea that there that the US was kind of going to be a friend in bilateral ways, right? Like a kind of support uh, system to Latin American countries uh, gets kind of radically changed. Uh, in some ways during the Cold War with the threat of leftist and uh, Soviet-influenced politics that the U.S. starts to be really concerned about the rise of uh, leftist guerrillas, right, of, of any kind of beachhead for Soviet influence in the uh, in the region, right, in their backyard, as, as some leaders have said. Um, so so there, there's a bunch of interventionism that happens where the U.S. is manipulating uh, directly or through economics or through gunboat diplomacy in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, the development of these nations, right? Um, the But once the Cold War happens, things really start to kind of ramp up. Um, and so Guatemala in the 1950s uh, elects a left-leaning uh, president and the United States, because of the good neighbor policy, is not going to go in and invade right, directly, but they fund the opposition, right, and they train them across the border uh, in Nicaragua, where there's a favorable right-wing government, um, and you find the U.S. saying, you know what, democracy, we're going to always talk about democracy, right, the U.S. government's always going to say we support democracy uh, abroad, we promote democracy abroad, but in Latin America, especially during the Cold War, uh, a dictator was just fine as long as they were anti-communist, um, and so there's examples of this in th throughout the region, um, but the the longest running of these is the dictator in the Dominican Republic, uh, Rafael Trujillo, who's in charge for 30 years, supported by the United States government, uh, because he was, as I believe Nixon called him, our bastard, right? He's a bastard, but he's our bastard. Um, and so there's this kind of sense that as long as the Soviets don't have any allies in our region, which Cuba dangerously flirts with and becomes in some ways in the 1960s that the that the U.S. is totally willing to say, yeah, democracy is great, but we're in crisis. It's Cold War. We need to make sure that there's no Soviet allies in our hemisphere that they were willing to support or even put in place um, uh, authoritarian leaders uh, who were on the right, on the, politically on the right. Um, and so there's a lot of really good scholarship on recent in the last 20 years that pushes back on this idea of the US being this kind of puppet master, that it's not just this kind of conspiracy theory where the CIA is the one pulling the strings. There are people on the ground in Buenos Aires. There are people on the ground in Santiago de Chile, in all of these places where there's been coups who that have put in place or where there's been support for right-wing dictatorships. There are people on the ground who want it also. There is a there's a long history of right-wing political activism in these countries too, right? So it's 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 weird to give agency to people who like supported uh, uh, a right-wing dictatorship, but I think it's important because it's not just the big bad U.S. doing this thing. It's the U.S. taking advantage of its, of its economic and political clout to kind of push things in the direction that they want them to go. Um, so the, the kind of maybe the most stark example, Cuba is its own unique case that we can talk about, but is the situation what happened in, in Chile in 1971 with Salvador Allende, who was elected, he was a left, he was a socialist, and he had an alliance of progressives and liberals and socialists, and he won the election. And so he's the first, arguably, the first socialist democratically elected in the Americas as president. Um, and that's a problem because it's not Cuba. The U.S. can't say, "Oh, they they're a dictator." He's you know he's Fidel Castro is a dictator. They they can't say that, right? And so there's very clear evidence of CIA documents of the United States physically uh, in, uh, implementing um, implementing not just taxes but like behind the scenes pressures economically on the uh, Chilean uh, in this case economy to make 
political unrest so unbearable that the person who they did support, who was Augusto Pinochet, would take over in a coup in 1973, which he did. And so there's a, a kind of the most dramatic, perhaps, example of the United States deciding to actually up help upend democracy. And again, this is this is Washington. This isn't necessarily the U.S. population, right? Um, this is the the government in Washington. Um, to 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 put in place a kind of right wing dictatorship that was pro free market that was anti communist um, that ended up imprisoning and disappearing thousands of people over the next seventeen years, um, and that is part of the kind of real politic of Cold War Western Hemisphere politics where the United States um, did what it believed it had to do right the president's in charge uh, you know uh, whether it's Nixon. Johnson, whoever, did what they needed to do to maintain complete uh, influence, if not dominance, throughout the hemisphere. Um, and the Cuban Missile Crisis is the kind of one big scare, right, where Cuba is seen as uh, housing and, and playing kind of host to Soviet intrigue 90 miles from Florida, right? Um, so there's a, there's a lot there's a lot of examples of U.S. involvement, indirect, covert, mostly covert, because the old gunboat diplomacy of pulling up with your ships outside of the port wasn't acceptable anymore after World War II. Uh, it really was almost all kind of CIA uh, development banks were really important. So the the um, kind of applying of uh, strings attached to funding. So the USAID might say to Bolivia, hey, Bolivia, you guys have a bunch of lithium mines, or then this time maybe it was copper, um, and we want the right-wing government to win so that the Soviets don't have a friend here. We're going to give the right-wing government all this money to invest in mining machinery uh, to pull out the the mining, the mining the copper that you want to sell, but you have to keep this guy in charge. You can't let the socialists take over, right, or the labor unions take over. So there's a lot of strings attached kind of investment through uh, USAID and other kind of semi-official uh, uh, funding, I guess. Um, on that note, to kind of segue, can you talk about um, the CIA in the U.S. in Latin America and kind of like the attacks on the Catholic Church? So there's, I mean, do you mean like liberation theology? Uh, I mean, like the assassination of the archbishop. Oh, so I actually, that's a little too too complicated, I think, for me to take on right now. Okay, um, okay. So um, what I will say is that there were, during the 1970s, mostly actually 60s starting, a lot of Catholic priests who were living in poor neighborhoods uh, in cities throughout the kind of the region, right? So whether it was Caracas, whether it was Lima, whether it was Mexico City, uh, had been trained in what was happening in, in the Catholic Church in Europe, which was a kind of progressive turn of the church. Um, so it turned towards kind of social sciences to uh, kind of thinking about workers as having collective rights, right, to promoting uh, kind of socialist policies. And in fact, there's a lot of movements, uh, Christians for Socialism during that period. And there is a lot of influence. A lot of people would argue during that period, a lot of kind of young priests would say Jesus was a socialist, right, that he wanted everybody to have uh, kind of enough and not anybody to have too much, uh, certainly nobody to lack what they needed. And so in city, in places like El Salvador, there was a there was a boom in what comes to be called liberation theology. Um, and these are leftist priests who oftentimes are seen as allies of, or even some became allies, and one even became in Colombia a guerrilla fighter uh, for these liberation armies, these leftist mostly Cuban-inspired liberation armies. Uh, and some of these priests get wrapped up in the kind of crossfire or caught in the crossfire between the U.S., who's still covertly trying to keep all the leftists out of power, uh, and these guerrilla fighters who are trying to you know, achieve political power in El Salvador or in uh, any of these countries, really, at the time. There's freedom fighters uh, fighting from a leftist model, um, most not successfully. Uh, and the United States was supporting, in most cases, the the kind of right wing uh, powers that be. Um, and so that's I hope I don't know if that can, it's a complicated question. Um, but the the Catholic Church itself remained very conservative throughout this period. It was these kind of progressive, mostly young, um, left leaning 
priests who who kind of stood with the people, stood with their cause, and gave them a moral and ethical uh, kind of push that maybe had you know wouldn't the, these groups maybe wouldn't have been as successful as they had been if they didn't have a Catholic priest saying yes, you're doing God's you know work to provide water and education to the people in these this slum. Um, and so there's that's kind of the, how the Catholic Church get caught between. And in the 1980s, under Pope John Paul II, there's a huge backlash on these liberation theologians, these these leftist priests. Many of them, a few of them are excommunicated. Uh, many of them are kind of removed from their posts. Um, and there's a kind of turn towards the right um, internationally within the Catholic Church in the 80s and 90s. Um, would you say that popes in Latin America are seen as more as political figures rather than religious figures? Yeah, that's a great question. I, so in the town, in the town that we used to live in, in the South here where my wife grew up, it's a tiny little town and there's two priests and there's like five nuns and the nuns are actually from Germany and the priests are from Peru. And they are, um, there's something that probably you have never experienced in your communities. If your community is anything like the one I grew up in, it's this like hybrid figure where it's like a, an authority and on questions of like morality. Um, anything where there's like needs to be a mediation between two people who are fighting the priest or the nuns are going to be there uh, in any of these little towns, really kind of anywhere. Uh, cities are a little bit different. Cities are much more like the United States. There's atheists, there's Jews, there's Protestant, you know, there's people from all different parts of the world, but in these little towns where the where almost everybody's Catholic and the church is in the main square and the bell rings at midday and like it, it's part of the rhythm of everyday life for everyone. Um, and so the priest is really this kind of like moral authority um, and um, almost kind of a mediator, I would say, um, but less political. They don't tend to, at least in my experience, get involved in like campaigning or that kind of thing. Back in the 60s and 70s, that was that was happening. Um, people were, church priests were much more kind of caught up in this revival that was happening in the Second Vatican Council in Europe, where they were saying, hey, go out and be with your flock, be with your people, suffer with them. And then they started being like, well, if my, if my flock is carrying guns and fighting against the dictator, maybe I should too, right? So there's this really interesting moment where um, that kind of stuff was happening. So I'm I'm generalizing, but I hope that maybe answers your question. I think the perfect way to wrap this up is uh, if you could give some advice to history students. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, what I would say is keep history with you no matter what you do. It doesn't have to be your major if that's not what you choose, but it'll always always serve you uh, whatever profession you go into if you can be like man those tax cuts back in the 1980s used to, like did x and y thing or whatever or like the housing projects that they built in new jersey in the 70s are falling down like if you can say things and think things that are informed by real historical events that you understand and that you um and that you can understand because you know how to read primary sources right you know how to go back and say hey what did that governor say in 1670s Philadelphia when he established our township or whatever, right? Like all of that stuff matters so much, no matter what profession you go into. Um, and so keep it with you. Even if keep your hobby up, read historical fiction, watch the movies. You don't have to be obsessed with the kind of academic side of history for it to be useful. Go to museums, travel, take your tour guide stuff around Europe when you go and like learn about, right? It's always, always going to be useful for you. And it's fun. Right. So keep keep enjoying it. And if you do find yourself going towards studying history um, and college or even thinking about it as a career, there are so many ways to do history. Right. You can work for a museum. You can work for a historical society, for an archive. You can be a high school history teacher. You can be a college history teacher. You can be a genealogical researcher. There's so many cool things that you can do to help people to have fun and to make money with the discipline of history. Thank you. And thank you for meeting with us. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. And John, it's been a real pleasure. I'll, uh, I'll talk with you again after, but thank you guys so much. Awesome questions and uh, great to see you all. See you, Dr. Casey.